File number 82-73A1-13, Easter Egg Police, Agent Nate, interrogating. State your name, please. Um, Nate? Crazy Nate? So tell me about the incident. Well, so I was watching The Incredibles 2 and I saw so many Easter eggs, references to Pixar employees, famous Easter eggs that everyone's looking for, like uh, the Pixar ball. What's that? Have you told anyone else about these Easter eggs, like your subscribers? Um, I might have told one or two. Hundred? Thousand? But I don't think they believe me though. You believe me though, right? Yeah, sure kid. I wish I could forget I ever saw the movie so that way I could watch it again for the very first time. You will, Nate. You will. Watch your very own Jack Jack? This baby turns the fire. Find these Easter eggs and comment where they are in the video for your chance to win your very own Jack Jack for the holidays. Speaking of holidays, I'm happy to announce I have my very own collectible pen now. And from now until Christmas, it's going to be on sale. I call it popcorn. And yes, it has a hidden Easter egg inside. If you haven't seen the movie yet, I'm warning you right now, this video is packed full of spoilers. I try to keep as many out as possible, but there's so many Easter eggs. You've been warned. It's very possible that Incredibles 2 might have the most Easter eggs referencing the Pixar employees in the history of Pixar movies. Incredibles 2 starts off where Incredibles 1 ended, fighting the Underminer. We know Pixar always uses their good luck charm to voice one of their characters, John Ratzenberger. And in Incredibles 2, just like Incredibles 1, he is the voice of the Underminer. Oh great! Now he's on the agenda! If you look in the parking lot, you will see the track field is across the street from 1200 Park Avenue. Just like we saw in Finding Dory, 1200 Park Avenue is the same address for Pixar Animation Studios. In the chase for Underminer, when Elastigirl is swinging from building to building like Spider-Man, the sign here says, We sell Kristoff overalls. Anthony Kristoff is the environment art director for the movie. You might have noticed when Dad wakes up from his mini coma, Dash is watching Johnny Quest. I remember back in the day being put on the waiting list at Blockbuster to rent Johnny Quest, so it's kind of fun to see that Pixar employees are also fans of Johnny Quest. We see Johnny Quest everywhere in the movie though, not just on the TV. When Dash is catching up to the action, you can see Quest Towers. Notice the custom queue? When Elastigirl is waiting to ambush Screenslaver on top of the television tower, we can see in the distance another Quest Tower. And again, when Elastigirl is trying to stop the runaway train, we see a quest building. And across the street from that is another quest building. Okay, just kidding on the last one, but it is Grindle Department Store. Nicole Grindle is one of the producers. We also see Grindle again during the helicopter chase, probably saving time recycling the backgrounds. One of the voice actors, Scott Minville, got his own sign with Mimv Inc. Thank you so much, young man. How about something more extreme, though? You might have heard or even seen for yourself where the Pixar ball is. But did you notice on Winston's limo, he also has Pixar balls in the center of his hubcaps. Look at that. Winston's dad wasn't just a fan of Pixar, he was a super fan of superheroes. Not only did he make a statue of Dinoguy, he also made one for Stratagal. At least it looks like Stratagal to me with the cape. After the disaster with the Underminer finally ends, Frozo makes a break for it into the alley. The trash can he's hiding behind is pretty cool, because it has the famous A113 on it, of course. Quest isn't the only surprise that we got to see on TV while watching TV through the movie. A lot of the footage used in the news was taken out of the original Incredibles. And just like in Monsters, Inc., Pixar still wants to show their love for Godzilla, but they probably still can't get permission to use Godzilla in their movie, so they make this cheap knockoff version. If you look under the couch, you will see the ducks that got stuck to Sully in Monsters, Inc. Bob also gets to see moments from the first movie when he's watching TV. And this quick flash is the opening for Outer Limits. Which reaches from the inner mind to the outer limits. Is this all vegetables? Who wanted all vegetables? And of course, we all knew about this one since before the movie was even released. The famous Chinese takeout box from so many movies like Bugs Life or Monsters, Inc. or even Inside Out. 
Of course, unlike Inside Out, the baby actually loves broccoli. If you don't like broccoli, try pouring a bunch of cheese on it. Remember that sign in the parking lot? Apparently that's not the only 1200 Park Avenue we see in the movie. If you stop long enough to read the business card for DevTech, you will notice they too are literally located at Pixar. And if you notice, his phone number also ends with 113. If you ask me, that's a little bit suspicious. It defines who I am. We're not saying you have... What? Someone on TV said it. Dash wasn't lying here, he really did hear that on TV. Another awesome superhero said something pretty darn close to that. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. This poor lady seems like she has a lot of bad luck. So much. She was almost killed by Underminer, and then she's almost killed by the screenslaver on the train. When Helen and Bob are fighting in the motel, if you look on the fridge, there's a drawing from one of the kids, but I'm not sure what it is. So what do you think, was it A, Arlo from Good Dinosaur, or B, Mr. Jones from Toy Story of Terror who was also in a hotel room, or three, a random drawing with absolutely no meaning? We should have never been able to see the drawing with the light though. The entire time they're arguing, the light is shining in from the bathroom. We know that because when Helen comes out of the bathroom, she shuts the bathroom light off. However, when they're arguing the entire time, if you look in the mirror, you can see the bathroom door was shut. That's awkward. Do you ever find it funny that we have fried cake for breakfast or sugar cereal with sugar milk and sugar orange juice? And then we call it the most important meal of the day. Well, apparently Pixar finds it funny as well. When Dash tries to load up on sugar bomb breakfast that's full of Pizza Planet Rocket marshmallows, you can see a little joke that the cereal is probably rich in something good, like pizza. When Elastigirl is hanging out in the alley, her dumpster isn't as cool as Frozone's dumpster because there's no A113, but the apartments across the street do reference to an older building, but not just any older building. This is the old address for Pixar where they used to be located. 1001 West Cutting Boulevard. Even though it seems like we have to make a billion versions of The Grinch, it's not the only book Dr. Seuss ever wrote. So come on Hollywood, let's spice it up a little bit. He also wrote a sleep book just like this to help get kids off to sleep. But his book probably didn't have any artsy version of a princess castle on the back of it. The first time I saw this movie, I thought the artwork here was a shout out to the original Pixar logo. However, the original logo had only four balls, not five. Evelyn tries to stroke Helen's ego, saying that she could have stopped the Underminer all by herself. You alone had handled the Underminer, things would have been different. And then Helen's like, girl, you're right, please. She couldn't even knock over the coolant tank on her own. How does she even remotely think she could possibly have taken out the Underminer alone? She does have a maximum stretch distance, so it's very possible if Bob didn't show up to help her, we would have two Elastigirls on our hands. <laughs> Here's an easter egg Pixar might not have even known they put in there themselves. We see a bunch of photographers. This one is especially special though. That long shiny tube that connects the flash to the camera is the kind of part that George used to make the first lightsaber in the original Star Wars. But who knows if the supers are actually part of the rebellion or not. Are you kidding me? The rebellion logo is literally in the clouds. Poor Michael Miller, he didn't even get to be in the credits, Pixar. Nice. However, according to IMDb, he was one of the ADR mixers. What? Who are you? What do you want? What are you doing? Or known as Automated Dialogue Replacement Mixer. Basically, these people are part of the team that was responsible for making sure the words being said match the movement of the lips of the characters. But he did get his own building though, so there's that. According to LinkedIn, Seert Huluf is a production coordinator at Pixar. In the runaway train scene, we see a Huluf ice truck stuck in traffic. The train scene had a ridiculous amount of Easter eggs, so obviously the train itself is also an Easter egg. When the train flies through one of the stations, if you blink as fast as Dash can, you can see the train number's MGLV-A113. Another building in the train chase scene has the name Imagier, as in Brian Imagier, who happens to be the shading art director. Have you ever wondered if Pixar employees have a bowling team? By the way, back in the train scene, we see there's an international bowling company with Pixar bowling balls as their logo. A unique building that takes a break from naming employees is Valiant Office Supplies. Valiant is a Disney movie about pigeon heroes. We can see D on this building. D. Selby is a Foley editor. A Foley artist named after Jack Foley is responsible for making all the little subtle sound effects that we hear in a movie, like the noise you hear when the box of cereal moves or a plant falling over. The type of sound effect can even change the mood. Without all these small little touches of audio, the movie wouldn't feel nearly as real as it does. All right, it looks like we only have one building left with a name on it. Everyone leave a comment who you think gets their name on the building. Nerdy Nate in the sound room, can I get a drum roll please? And the final name is... Matt Nolte, character art director, you get a building. 
But wait a second, what's this? Derek Thompson, storyboard artist. Rob Thompson, character development. You get a building. Patera, the sets dressing artist. You get a building. Nathan Ferris, the set supervisor. You get a building. Rick Sayer, supervisor, technical director. You get a building. Tim Emmett, set designer. You get a building. Michael Warch, the shot production manager. You get a building. Everybody gets a building. Well, poor Ted Mathet, even though you're a story supervisor, you didn't get a building. This has been sufficiently awkward. Sorry, we ran out. Instead though, you get to be part of the affiliate press in the newspaper. Please be fair and balanced. The new urban tunnel was established in 1954, and on October 27, 1954, Disneyland Television aired their very first TV show. One Easter egg a lot of you were screaming online that you found was the one in Jack-Jack's bedroom. If you look on the crib, you will see the sea lion is holding the Pixar ball. Also, the little baby toy hanging above the crib seems to have some sort of abstract form of the Pixar ball. It does have all the colors and the shapes that you need to make the ball. But wait a second, don't forget to look at the other side of the room. We have an airplane over there from Toy Story. And apparently it looks like Disney is still hypnotizing us with hidden Mickeys. In the screenslaver's layer, we see a Hypnomatic. Magically, it's in the shape of a Mickey. And this ambassador looks like she has a hidden Mickey on her bubble shirt. Sadly, Bud Lucky, who used to voice Rick Dicker, passed away since the last incredible so he did not voice Rick Dicker. He also used to be the voice of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh and Chuckles in Toy Story 3. Now this next one probably is not an Easter egg but I'm gonna say it anyways because I can. The voice of Rick Dicker is none other than Jonathan Banks who also plays as Mike in Breaking Bad and in Better Call Saul. At the same time the voice of Winston Dever the business shark was Bob Odenkirk. I hope I said that right I don't want to get sued. Yeah that's uh that's my legal opinion. Because he also voiced Saul Goodman, who is the legal shark in the show Breaking Bad and the show Better Call Saul. And they both supported the lead character. So if this superhero thing doesn't work out for Bob, we know another way he can buy a house like that. By opening a legal, law-abiding KFC. Okay, okay, more Easter eggs. Winston's face was actually designed after a shark's fin. And because of that, it's not a coincidence that we see his table is in the shape of a surfboard. Rick gets his own Easter egg too. When he's packing up for retirement, check out his coffee cup. Look familiar? What if I said Mount Wanahakalugi? Mount Wanahakalugi. That's right, this is modeled after one of the tiki statues that's in the dentist's fish tank in Finding Nemo. Even though the Pars lost almost everything they had in the house when the plane destroyed everything, somehow Bob's coffee mug from InsuraCare was saved. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm calling that one an Easter egg. Then there's Void. Her coffee cup wasn't an Easter egg though, it was just a mistake. When the cup is traveling from one void to the other void, it reappears from the other void before entering its last void. And it's actually coming up from the outside of the void, it didn't even pass through the void. Another oops was when dad tries to fix a relationship he broke with Violet and Tony by going to where he works, because that's not creepy. Watch the hostess when she picks up a bunch of menus then goes to seat them, and never gives them the menus. No wonder Bob's complimenting the water. He doesn't know what else they sell there. This is really good water. It's very refreshing. Spring water, is it? I don't know, sir. I think it's tap. Well, it is very good. Excellent tap. Or is this hostess just an amazing magician? One second she's holding menus, the next second, abracadabra, baby seat. Even though Bob failed that day at playing matchmaker, if we look at the day he got mad and woke up his car because some rich guy had it, that's my car! He succeeded at playing matchmaker. What's wrong with that? I can see what's happening. What? And they don't have a clue. Who? They'll fall in love and here's the bottom line. That car doesn't belong to you. One thing Pixar did a great job on hiding, and honestly I didn't even notice till the second or third time watching, was the breadcrumbs that they left leading us to who the villain was. Final chance, spoiler alert. The screensaver likes taking over televisions and using different patterns of static to brainwash us. The bad person wears clothing that resembles the same static that we see throughout the movie. Another fun, not so spoiler of an Easter egg was Tony Reitinger's locker is, you guessed it, A113. We're in a new house. I did write my address on your locker in permanent ink. And thanks to Violet destroying public property, we get to see where the pars are actually staying. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> 
points for funny. The mansion is located at 924 Paradise Drive, which is a real address in California. However, I couldn't find anything of significance at that address except for the fact that it's a hop skip across the water from Pixar. One thing that may or may not be of coincidence though is the address of the most expensive house for sale in the country is 924 Bel Air Road. True, it's not Paradise Lane, but the address is 924. That in itself has to be an Easter egg. Especially since the real life house has a Disney theme inside it. When Bob and Helen are on the phone, if you look in her hotel room, there's an interesting art piece on the wall. This symbolizes all the Incredibles, Bob, Violet, Dash, Jack-Jack, and even Helen. Even though Helen is all the way on the other side because she is away from them on a mission, disconnected from her family. During the World Trees PD to accept supers again, the contract they are signing has the code California A113 up in the corner. And apparently several of the ambassadors work for Pixar. Alan Barlero, the supervising animator, and Korea Yoku is in the character of development. If you look at the cargo in the ship, it also has A113. They really love A113 in this movie. When Violet finally gets her movie date with Tony, the feature film is Dementia 13. If you look closely though, there's an extra one in there making it spell A113. And just to help us out, they changed the color of the letter A to make it more obvious. But there was actually a movie released during this time era called Dementia 13. The movie was about... Actually, I forgot what the movie was about. But what about the Pizza Planet truck? Did they forget to add it? Again? No, they didn't. And they even went so far to change the design of the truck. And to help you try to find the Pizza Planet truck, they left you a clue to where you could expect to find it. And even possibly who the driver is, which could be the reason why the truck isn't the traditional truck that we see. Remember when Elastigirl asked the screensaver who she got arrested? Who did I put in jail? Pizza delivery guy. Who drives pizza trucks? Pizza delivery guy. When Elastigirl chases him right out of the building, look closely into the parking lot when they're landing on the ground and you will see... The Pizza Planet truck. And who knows, maybe Woody's in the trunk. Can I get a high five for that one? What an idiot. We almost got to see the babysitter from the first Incredibles make it into this movie, but unfortunately that scene got deleted. However, we still get to hear a shout out from her genius babysitting skills. <laughs> it's time for cognitive development. Specifically, Mozart. I blended Kevlar with carbine for durability under duress and cotton for comfort. We know Pixar hides Easter eggs to their future movies and their current movies, only it's not always as obvious as we would expect it to be. Like in Finding Dory, the Easter egg for cars was a band-aid. I don't think it's going to be obvious what the Easter egg is until Toy Story 4, like it's not going to be Bo Peep. This is going to be forcing us to go back and re-watch Incredibles 2 after Toy Story 4 comes out, unless they spoil it of course in a trailer. But I see two spots that have something toy related that doesn't seem to fit with the movie. One is inside Jack-Jack's crib, there's an action figure that looks like it belongs with a group of lost toys in Toy Story of Terror. So he could be a character that we see in Toy Story 4, because background props don't usually have as much detail as this toy has. The second possibility I see is they just released the first teasers to Toy Story 4, and in one of them they tease the two new characters, a bunny and Ducky the duck. Jack-Jack likes ducks, and he even wears a duck onesie, and even throws a toy duck at Tony. So what do you think, do you have a better idea of what the easter egg is to Toy Story 4? Or are you watching this video a year from now, commenting the correct answer and pretending that you knew the entire time? If you can't or don't want to find the hidden easter eggs for your chance to win Jack-Jack, I have something else that you might want to win. If you're an expert of Incredibles 2, then I challenge you to go to crazynate.com and take the quiz, Are You Too Incredible? Be the first person to get all the questions right and tweet at me the winning page so I know that you won and you will win this LEGO's incredible set. Don't forget to pick up your popcorn pen for somebody you love today. Great stocking stuffer for Christmas. More importantly than that, I hope you had fun today. Subscribe so you don't miss our next adventure. Let me know what movie you want to talk about next and remember most importantly of all, gents and gentlets, share a smile. They are contagious. Did you have fun finding all those little hidden Easter eggs? Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because you're never going to remember. Hey, share a smile. They're contagious. Can you imagine a day without smiling? Whew, that would be outrageous. Thanks for stopping by and hanging out with Crazy Nate. Make sure to leave a thumbs up if he left you feeling great. Have fun and we'll see you next time. 
And don't forget to subscribe.